one of the the questions that has been on my that has been on our mind for for a long time is essentially the question um, how do people navigate the world that they inhabit when we move around in our world there are constant signs everywhere there's language there's um, writing everywhere with this research over a longer period of time is to to understand how written objects shape people's behaviors. We study Roman inscriptions and uh, there's a particular thing we wanted to study is the how ancients engaged with these uh, peculiar monuments. The thing with texts in the ancient world was not that different uh, from our time. Our Roman would have encountered lots of different sorts of uh, inscriptions. You could find signs from, for example, bars and taverns and different sorts of stores. The greatest bodies of um, evidence that we have for the ancient world of uh, funerary inscriptions, tombstones, headstones, um, sarcophagi. And when, when you look at these texts, you can learn a lot of things. Um, you can learn about attitudes towards life and death and you can learn about society and it's, it's fascinated me a long time since my own times as a goth, you know, so I've, I've never really gone away from the, the cemetery, I've just gone back further in, in time. The case of, of the epitaph that we are dealing with here, the epitaph for, for Margarita, so this is essentially an inscription that commemorates the life and premature death of a lapdog. It came to Britain at a certain point in modern times, we don't know exactly uh, when, and it's kept in the uh, dark room in the British Museum. It has this, this wonderful little little chamber, not often accessible with, with inscriptions, just hidden around the corner from the famous uh, mausoleum. Margarita um, was a dog, a very precious dog, who died, unfortunately, uh, giving birth, and their owners um, made her uh, Tombstone in verse. Gallia me genuit nomen mi divitis undae, conca dedit formae nominis aptus onos. Docta per incertas audax discurrere silvas, colibus irsutas atque agitare feras. Non gravibus vinculis unquam consueta teneri, verbera nec niveo corpore saeva pati, moli nanque sinu domini dominaeque iacevan, et noram in strato las acubare toro, et plus quam liqui muto canis ore loquevar, nulli latratus per ti muere meos, sed iam fata subi partu iactata sinistro, Quam nunc sub parvo marmore terra tegit, Margarita. The poem is really good. Um, there's always a little mistake in the in the last word that the stone cutter uh, inscribed uh, "teget," and then he tried to correct it into "tegit." Um, but apart from that, we could say that the inscription is almost. Perfect. The text that, like in, in the instance of the Margarita epitaph, speaks in the first person, actually makes you a mouthpiece for the deceased. Isn't that fascinating? Talking in the first person wasn't that strange in the ancient world, because um, sometimes uh, tombstones were supposed to be talking to uh, people that pass by so that you stay there and read their story. It seems to be a, a, a pet very close to the owners, but it was also used for hunting. Pointing out that um, the dog died while giving birth um, seems to suggest that the dog was clearly also an object to produce offspring, to produce further value. The, the way in which this dog is described, could that be a description for a slave also? Human remains had to be buried outside the, the city walls, so you, you find these streets lined with um, tombs and funerary monuments and, and so forth. I think the Roman deaths were much more alive than that our deaths. The mortality rate was higher than today's uh, rate, but also because 
the roads outside uh, towns were filled up with inscriptions of dead people. So you had to see them if you, tra you were traveling. You, if you want to be remembered, you need to get the attention, to seek attention from the, the people who, who were you know, standing by, walking by, stopping by. So inscriptions in ancient times were essentially attention seekers. People normally uh, uh, stop to read the stones and the inscriptions and mm, do other things as well. <laughs> such, as <laughs> such as pee and... <laughs> <laughs> you actually can find inscriptions uh, asking the, the passerby not to be the, the tombstone. There's this fascinating research done by Maria Limon on, um, on, on, on the way in which textual design is 100% is calculated in, in, in a way that it draws you near and you know because you have the name in big letters oh yes that's the place where I want to go I can see the sign and then you step closer and you, you see the intimacy of, of a little poem, of, of something that really reconnects you with an individual whose very first line reminds you of Virgil who famously said that Mantua gave birth to him and in, in this case it's Gaul that sired um, this, this particular dog. So various inscriptions in the ancient world shared all the, some sort of layout code so that people knew almost without reading them that this was a, an epigraphic poem. For example, in the case of Margarita's uh, tombstone, you can see that uh, each line is a verse and you can see that the even ones are indented. That means that Margarita's poem was composed in elegiac distics. The way in which we encounter objects now in museums and collections um, is essentially in a situation in which they have been decontextualized. People do not read inscriptions because these inscriptions are in Latin or Greek, taken out from the context where they were uh, put. In. So we don't know what kind of decoration they have, if they were painted, if they have some sculpture attached, and you just find a cold object without any kind of meaning. It's like taking a shop sign off the shop and putting it into an art gallery. Yes, it's still the same object, but its meaning, its, its function, it's, it's completely stripped of all of this. It would have been in a crowded place where people go around and... She was dead, but <laughs> the context was alive. This whole interaction with the, with the object is something that can't happen in a museum. A museum will tell you to stay away. Um, look, but don't come too close. Um, look, but don't touch. Um, look, but don't interact. Also, could you please keep the voice down because it will annoy everyone else. And while they do this for perfectly good reasons, to us it's important to understand that actually this is the exact opposite of the experience of people in the ancient world. It, it seems kind of ironic to bring a tombstone back to life, but these, these objects were designed for the living that the true value is that it, it actually reconnects us with some, with an unbroken tradition of, of humanity, of, of connecting us with those who came before us. If you go to the British Museum, all of them, they want to go to the Rosetta Stone or to the Elgin Marbles, but these small pieces give us much more information about day-to-day -day life of Roman time than the big ones. So that's a way of really knowing what was going on in ancient times. So it's, it makes, requires a bit of an effort, but in the end you get much closer to the, to the ancient uh, times than with the big pieces of uh, in a Greek museum.